Right. Well, I hope everybody's doing well this morning. Uh, we had, so far at the beginning of this year, we've uh, really had a lot of incredible services. Uh, we spent the first four weeks of the year going through a series uh, called Detox, where we were just looking at um, toxic behaviors and influences and relationships uh, that can come in and contaminate our relationship with God and keep us from really becoming everything that God has called us to be. And um, that was a, a very impactful series. Uh, if you want to go back and watch any of those messages, you can watch them on our website uh, or, or our YouTube channel. So uh, those are on there. Uh, very, very powerful series. Um, and then last week, we had the opportunity, uh, a friend of mine, Tarek Glenn, who played for the Indianapolis Colts when they won the Super Bowl in 2007. He, he came in. Uh, it was Super Bowl Sunday, of course. And he was sharing his story uh, just about grit and what it takes many times. Uh, a lot of times what we said at the end of the service is that God will, will give us promises, uh, but his process seems to be that he gives us these promises and then we have to fight for these promises and believe sometimes over years to see them come to pass. And so Tarek had an opportunity to share about... Uh, uh, for seven years, the Indianapolis Colts were right on the verge of, of winning a Super Bowl. And uh, every year it would end in, in defeat. And what that took to press through uh, to ultimately get there. And he, he had an interesting comment. He said, he said, you know, for all the grit that I needed as a professional athlete, um, it does not compare to the grit that I have needed as a husband and a father. That, that that has taken more grit uh, to be able to, to uh, walk in those areas. And so we're starting a new series here this morning, and um, it's called Habits. Habits. And essentially what it is that we want to accomplish over the next five weeks is, is this idea um, that growth doesn't just happen in a vacuum. That growth, God has a desire for every single one of us to grow. But it doesn't just happen uh, accidentally. That uh, we uh, have to be very intentional uh, many times in order to grow. We know this in our lives. We know this in areas of professional development or areas in our career or if we're a musician or if we're an athlete or we're a dancer or we're a business owner, we have to be very intentional to be able to grow. And so um, for me, when I was growing up, um, I at times liked to experiment and do things that were outside of the box a little bit. Um, I remember when I was in fifth grade, uh, we had this uh, after-school kind of fun club thing, and um, I had this magic set at home. And I remember going and signing up and saying, I was going to teach these magic classes, and I did not know magic <laughs> at all. And, uh, you know, but I was like, hey, I want to step out of the box and try this. And, and one of the things when I was growing up is me and my brother, we wanted to at one time grow these, these flowers and these plants in our home. And so we went out and we got the, the, the nice, um, you know, casing and the vase and we put the soil in it and we put these plants in it and we were like, okay, you know, we're going to grow these things. And we had the instructions of how it was supposed to be done. And I got off to a pretty good start and that my plant began to grow. It was probably about two inches high. And then I forgot to take care of it. Uh, I had it in my room with the blinds closed. It wasn't getting any sunlight. I forgot to water it for days on end. And I remember coming back one time into my room and I, I looked and over there on the uh, windowsill was this plant that was dead, was dying. Because see, the reality is, is that all of us, so plants 
need certain ingredients to be able to grow. You need good soil. You need sunlight. You need water. You need somebody who's going to keep the bugs and the birds from coming in and eating it up. It takes intentionality for that plant to grow. It takes intentionality for children to be able to grow up from the little babies that they are up until the mature adults that you want them to be. When, I was, uh, when we were living in Indianapolis, um, our son, Brett, who's our oldest, he's back there working the slides. Uh, I remember when he was in middle school, and I came home one day, and I saw him doing his homework. And I came home the next day, and he was doing his homework and the next day. And I remember saying to April, wow, like Brett is like maturing. He's taking responsibility. He's growing. And it's so, it was so incredible to see when children do that, when plants do that, um, we as people. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to focus in the next five weeks on things that help us grow in our spiritual walk, in our walk with Christ. Um, If you don't have water, if you don't have good soil, if you don't have nutrients, it's very, very hard to grow. So if you have your Bible or you can look on the screen, um, the first point I want to make is just this is that God desires for us to grow. He desires for us to grow. It doesn't matter what stage of life that we're in. It doesn't matter how old we are. It doesn't matter what our past is like. God's desire is that, that we would grow and into the person that he created us to be. Amen? Like when God, when God created each and every one of us, he created us uniquely with a unique DNA. He created us with unique gifts. He created us with unique abilities and talents. And what happened is, is that sin came into the world, and it, 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 what, what it did is it created the broken image of God in us. But God still has that calling and that potential on our lives. So he, it doesn't matter how old you are. Some people think, oh, I'm 50 years old. I'm arrived. That's how old I am. I've arrived. I don't need to grow anymore. Listen to this. I found this quote this week that I thought was amazing. It's by a famous musician named Pablo Casals, who, after having recently just performed at the United Nations at 81 years old, agreed to have Robert Snyder make a movie about him. It was called A Day in the Life of Pablo Casals. Snyder asked Casals, the world's foremost cellist, why he continued to practice four and five hours a day. Casals answered, because you know, I think I'm making progress. He was the foremost cellist in the world. He was 81 years old, and he was still practicing four to five hours. It doesn't matter how old you are, what your past is. God God's desire is that we would be continually growing, growing. Look at uh, the scriptures with me. Look at what God says this in Ephesians 4, 14 through 16. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. 
From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This is uh, Ephesians 4 is written. um, The context of it is is the local church. And, and, And what it says right before this, if you get an opportunity to go back and look, it says that, you know, that, that Christ has given certain gifts in the church. He's given these things called apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists. It's called the fivefold ministry. And he says he's given these things for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service. Okay? So, in other words, that God has given these gifts into the church, these leadership gifts really as coaches to help you become everything you have been called to be spiritually. That's what, that's the context that Paul is talking about here. Okay. He's, so he's saying though, but this, but the result of it is that, that we would grow, that we would grow individually and that we would grow as a body. Look at this second scripture. It's in Psalm 92, 14. It's actually one of my favorite in the Bibles. The Bible it says, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. Now, interesting, there's a lot of power words in there, okay? A lot of power words, flourish, grow, flourish, bear fruit, fresh, green, okay? These are are communicating God's heart and desire for each of us. He's like, man, I want want you to flourish. He does not want the plant over on the side wilted, getting no sunlight. He loves it when the garden is beautiful. Amen? He loves that. Okay? But interesting, what's right in the middle of all these power words, flourish and and grow, and bear fruit, and all these things. Listen, it's a powerful thing. What's right in the middle of that is this, planted in the house of the Lord. Planted in the house of the Lord. Listen, listen. I can tell you, everything in culture today is trying to push you away and push us away from being planted in the local church. Everything in culture. A few weeks ago, I was watching a pastor up in Dallas. Matt Chandler is his name. He's an incredible pastor. He's an incredible teacher. And he did this whole thing. And, and I'm like, look, I got kids. I got kids that play AU basketball. I got kids that, that do dance and, and all this stuff. But what he was saying was, he says, our culture today schedules a million things on Sunday I can't go to church anymore. And I, listen, I, I get it because I have kids that do all that. His point was it's like everything in culture is trying to get you out of, it's church hurts. I got hurt at this church. I'm throwing the church away. I love Jesus, but I hate his people, right? Like this is a reality of, of the culture that we live in. But look at what it says most important thing is in all of that is is where you're planted because if you're not planted you can't grow if you take a plant and you pull it out of its pot and you go and you leave it hanging out for a day or two it's gonna die if you take it pull it out put it in a different pot right 
Pull it out after a few weeks. Put it in another pot. Pull it out. Put it in another pot. Right? It's going to get stressed. It's going to get stressed and it will die. There's something about when you allow your roots to go down deep in the house of God. Psalm 1 says, what the, the man who is blessed, what has his, what roots planted deeply in the rivers of living water? You have to allow your roots to go deep. Listen, I'm telling you, one of the greatest decisions that I ever made as a 24, 25-year-old individual was to say, you know what? I want to I wanna plant my life in the purposes of God. And I'm going to intentionally put myself into environments where I can grow and become everything that God has called me to be. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to intentionally... Listen, you don't think I had a lot of stuff to do and a lot of opportunity? I did. But you know what? I was like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to plant myself in the house of God and God's purposes and allow him to raise me up. Last scripture. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3. He's talking about these, these conflicts that were going on in the church. Essentially, what was happening is that people were kind of saying, hey, man, I'm kind of of this clique, <laughs> right? I'm of Paul. You're of Apollos. You're, you know, and, and Paul comes and he goes, no, 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 dude. There ain't no cliques in Jesus. <laughs> there ain't no cliques in the body of Christ, right? We're all one by. So Paul's dealing with this, but then he says something. Look, he says, so what, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. So Paul's writing and he says, look, hey man, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. God's desire for every single one of us is that we would grow, that we would grow. Everything out there in culture is actually pushing against us growing. It wants to create an apathy in us, an indifference in us, right? That's what, what, it, what it wants to do. All right, so second thing. So not only does God God desires for us to grow, but listen, if you, if truly, if you could just allow me to boil down our mission at Renovate into one statement, it would probably be this, that April and I and our team here, our absolute passion is to see every single one of you growing and being who God has created you to be. Everything that we do, everything, the services, 33 men's meetings, deeper gatherings, women's Bible studies, Nicaragua mission trips, everything that we do is with this goal in mind. Is to, is to see every single person in here growing. Growing in what way? Well, we want to see you grow in your understanding of God's word. We want to see you grow in your relationship with Jesus. We want to see you grow in Christ-like character. And we want to see you grow in the unique purpose that God has for your life because he does have a unique purpose for you. And the more that you discover 
what it is, the more life that you'll have. So it's our passion. It's, 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 it's the, the goal of the local church is to see people flourishing and growing. Let me just give you a couple examples. When I was, uh, when I was a freshman in college, I got, got to college and um, I was actually supposed to redshirt my freshman year. And uh, the guy, one of my teammates, ended up getting injured. He hurt his knee, had to have some arthroscopic knee surgery. And I ended up doing a lot better in preseason than they anticipated. And one of the reasons I did better is because I had an assistant coach on the team who's now a pretty famous guy. You see him out there on ESPN all the time. His name is Fran Frischilla. And Fran was an assistant coach at Ohio University when I was there. And Fran, what he did is every single day, he'd say, hey, man, do you have an hour today? And I'd say, yeah, I have an hour. He said, come in because I want to watch film with you. And I want to show you all the things that you're doing right. And I want to show you all the things that you're doing wrong. Because, like, I really think you can become the, one of the best players to ever play at this. He invested in me. He invested in me. He took this scrawny, 170-pound freshman kid, and he invested that entire year into helping me grow in my knowledge of the game. He he helped me grow in my application. He he helped me to uh, work through setbacks and difficulties. Look, it applies not only in the sports world, it applies in the academic world. Our kids were, uh, when they were in high school, they were having a really hard time with algebra. And a really hard time. And and we got the name of a lady in Indianapolis. She was was supposed to be one of the best tutors. Her name was Mrs. Bloomer. And we called Mrs. Bloomer and we said, hey, can we get our boys in tutoring with you? And she said, absolutely. And so we would meet her at this mire that was halfway between our house and, and where she lived. And she would take an hour to an hour and a half, two to three days a week, and she would help my sons, Brett and Elijah, block algebra because they were stuck. She was willing to invest into them. It works in sports. It works in academics. It works spiritually. I was at one of my lowest points in ministry. I was, had transitioned from planting a church in Indianapolis, and I was assistant basketball coaching on a 7th and 8th grade team with the executive pastor at Traders Point Church. And we got to know each other a little bit. And uh, one day at the end of a basketball game, I said to him, I said, I said, Jim, you have a lot more knowledge when it comes to church You've been doing this for 20 years. I mean, you're amazing. Would you, would you mentor me? And he said, absolutely. Come into my office on Tuesday and uh, we'll sit down and, and talk. They ended up hiring me, but Jim was my direct report for seven years. And he poured into me to help me grow as a leader as a communicator, as an outreach pastor. I mean, he, he, he poured his life into me. The point that I'm making is, is that do you have people in your life that are helping you grow spiritually? Or have you just said, I don't need that anymore? I don't, I've kind of reached a point where I, I really don't need Look, Tiger Woods got to that point. 
Tiger Woods got to the point where he was so good, he fired his coach. Good move or bad move? Coach Donnie. <laughs> you need a coach. You need somebody that's pour, pouring into your life. Look, that's, that's our passion here. That's our passion. Last way to illustrate it, in 2006, uh, an incredible movie came out, and I don't know if you saw it. It was called uh, Aquila and the Bee. Aquila and the Bee. And uh, essentially the story, that's Lawrence Fishburne, is there was this girl, um, her name was Aquila Anderson. She was 11 years old. She was a spelling bee enthusiast. And she was attending Crenshaw Middle School in Los Angeles. And essentially, what happens is, is she kind of uh, stumbles into this local school spelling bee. And she ends up winning it. And Lawrence Fishburne, who plays the character, uh, uh, his name is actually um, Joshua Larrabee. He was a visiting English professor who was visiting the area. He kind of kind of finds out about Aquila, and uh, he begins to invest into her. Right, because he's like, you could you could become a national spelling bee champion, and he begins to invest. And then he comes to a certain point though, where he he pulls away, and he was like, I'm not going to coach you anymore. But here's the interesting point. If you've seen the movie, Akila, at first, she doesn't want a coach. She goes, I can do this by myself. She doesn't want a coach. And she goes, she gets invited over from this other, from this, this, uh, this boy who was also a spelling bee enthusiast. And they end up going over to this individual's house uh, who two years in a row was the national runner-up. And he was Oriental. And, and they meet and she shares about how she wants to, to, to get to the national level. And he throws out a word to her that sounds like it should start with Z, but it starts with X. And he says, spell this. And she says, um, X. And he goes, you need to get a coach. You need to get a coach. Because you'll never, you'll never become everything that you were called to be without it. Without it. She ends up getting a coach. She gets all the way to the national and ends up being co-national champion. Nobody expected it coming from Los Angeles. Third thing, so not only does God desire us to grow, we're passionate about it. Listen, God, God takes growth really seriously, really seriously. Look at this passage of Scripture. It's in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, and it's, it's actually written in the form of a, of a song, it says this, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one, that's God, had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and he cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? God is talking there specifically about the nation of Israel. And he goes like, like, look, like, 
what more could I have done for you? Like I rescued you and my presence was with you and I gave you everything you needed and provision and protect. Like, and, 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 and I was wanting fruit to come out of this. And he says, but like no fruit. Can, like, look, man, I put it on a fertile hillside with choicest vines. I built a watchtower and a wine press. Like I did everything. And, you know, he's talking about Israel there. But you know what? In the New Testament, Jesus talked a lot about fruit. And he went up to a fig tree. And he's like, this fig tree hasn't borne fruit for three years. He's like, let me cut it down. And he's like, no. And some people are like, no, 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 no. Put some more, you know, fertilizer around it. Give it some more time. He's like, all right, I'll do He's interested. God is, takes growth, our growth, very, very seriously. He wants, look, he's put an incredible investment into us. And he really wants, he's like, man, I want, I want to see, I want to see fruit coming out of your life. So what, what kind of fruit does God want to see coming out of our life. I think the first is just fruit of character. Right? The Bible talks about like you'll know people by their fruits. Can a good tree produce bad fruit? Can a bad tree produce good fruit? Right? So, so look at your life and say, hey, what kind of fruit am I producing? But then there's the fruit of ministry. Because guess what? God has called all of us to bear fruit in our lives, right? Um, that's, that's other people that our lives have impacted. It's the fruit of ministry, okay? So we have to look at our lives and say, hey, what kind of fruit am I bearing, okay? And then last is this. So not only does God desire for us to grow, we're, we're passionate about it here. God takes it very, very seriously. But then last is this. We have to be serious about our growth. Growth requires our involvement and participation. This week I was reading, and I'll end, I was reading um, a summary of a book that I'd heard about probably six or seven years ago. And it was a fascinating book. I'd read two other books by this author, um, Malcolm Gladwell. And Malcolm Gladwell uh, wrote The Tipping Point, uh, which was uh, an incredible book about how cultural movements take place. And then he wrote a book called Blink about how uh, most of us, within the first few seconds of meeting somebody or being in a situation, you know, we can, we, we can discern, uh, you know, that person or that situation and all that. But he wrote another book uh, recently, and it was called um, Outliers. And basically, he, was, he, he, he came from the position of wanting to see what were the factors that lead to people being successful in any area? So, like, what, what, what is the combination of things? And one of the things that he talked about in there is this thing called the 10,000-hour rule that typically it takes... 10,000 hours of investment into something before you become highly proficient at it. This weekend, I had the opportunity to uh, go watch my daughter Mia dance uh, at the Westwood 
dance classic it, all day yesterday. Mia started at nine with her solo, went all the way until I, I left at like eight. I got bored. And I'm watching, I'm watching these girls dance, and one of the girls that dances with her, uh, uh, who comes to church periodically, um, Alicia, Alicia Williams. And uh, she's a beautiful dancer. She's 14 years old, and I was watching her dance, and uh, it was beautiful. She ended up taking first place in the competition. It's just a beautiful dance. And I mean, I was really, I was like crying watching her dance. And somebody kind of sitting over here said, uh, I didn't know who they were, the group. They, they said, um, wow, she's just so lucky. She has so much talent. And I was like, you have no idea how much work goes into being able to do that. Hours upon hours of ballet and stretches and, I mean, class, all this. It takes 10,000 hours to be able to be highly proficient or breakthrough in something. I thought of Rebecca over here who played high-level volleyball and Isabel plays high-level volleyball. And the amount of intentionality that it takes to grow and develop as a player. Like you have to go and, and stretch and do explosion drills and right and get in the weight room and do dives on the floor over and over and over and over and serves and blah 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 right it didn't just you didn't just show up and it happened I think of Jason on his guitar right people say oh man your worship guy is talented oh yeah dude he just picked it up a week ago Spirit of God fell on him, dude. It was awesome, man. Dude never played an instrument in his life. He just got up there and just, dude, he was making it happen. It doesn't happen like that. It doesn't happen like that. So here's my last point is, are you investing in to the most important area of your life with the same intentionality? See, the Bible says in Timothy, physical training is of some value, but godliness has value in all things. God desires us to grow. It's a church. We're passionate about it. That's what April and I and our team want to give our lives for. We're coaches, man. Coaches love when their players, like, do great. God takes it seriously. And he asks us to take it seriously as well. So listen, over the next five weeks, we're going to look at the five most important things that help us grow. Man, I hope you come back. I hope you, you in your heart, you say, you know what? Man, I want to I be intentional with this. I, I want to I grow, not go backwards in my faith. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for, um, God, your, your grace. Thank you for your word. Um, Lord, I just, um, God, it is your desire that every single one of us here would grow, um, grow in our faith, grow in our fruitfulness, Lord, grow in our character, grow in our calling and purpose. Lord, we just... Um, I pray that, uh, Lord, we, every person here, Lord, um, that they would have hearts uh, to, to want to grow. And um, we just uh, ask for over these next weeks as we look at the, the things that help us to grow, um, Lord, just uh, let your grace and anointing be upon that. Um, Lord, help us to, to be intentional with it and implement it in our lives. And we ask it in your name, in Jesus' name, amen.